мы э, сейчас первый доклад о выступлении представим Джудио Патре Джосес из университета Бордо, Франции. Э, господин, Все, пожалуйста, регламент у нас 15 минут. И с последующим э, обсуждением с вопросами. Пожалуйста. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm not the only sociologist who takes the floor since Monday, so that's good. Um, can you hear me loud and clear, everyone? Okay. Um, first, let me thank again uh, the University of Samara and the UN USA for having organized this event. Um, my talk may be a little bit provocative or completely crazy, but I, well, I don't mind, so that's okay. Um, I will try to introduce an ID. This is a, a theoretical ID, so this is not a project uh, which aims to be implemented, but I think that talking about an Eastern Cuban Space Organization um, allows to highlight some institutional mechanisms which are involved in the administration of space programs. So, I will start with um, two questions. The first one is how would it be relevant to base a political, um, let's say an institutional frame upon space science and space technology? I think this is a relevant topic for uh, our workshop. And the second question may be the most provocative because um, what I'm asking you is, is the state, uh, nation state still a relevant scale to administrate space programs? Um, the point of my presentation is to talk about regional administration of space programs. So, um, the point is that what I choose to call an Eastern European Space Organization already have uh, some foundations, institutional foundations, related to the history of Eastern Europe. So that is uh, what I will talk about now. Um, so there are three kinds of uh, foundations, three kinds of ingredients, if you, if you like. The first one is related to the way uh, the scientific research was uh, organized at the Soviet Academy of Sciences. The second point is uh, related to uh, the regulation of economic affairs in Eastern Europe since the dismantlement of the Soviet Union. And the third point is about um, the organization of UN regional groups. So first, first uh, eventual foundation for um, an Eastern European space organization uh, is about uh, the Soviet Academy of Science. Uh, I think that the image is quite bad, but that's okay. Um, as most of you may already know, but that's something I recently learned uh, working on archives at the Soviet Academy of Sciences in Moscow. Um, this is that um, the Academy, Soviet Academy of Sciences, especially regarding space science, was organized with a um, a disciplinary division of labor between uh, Soviet Union's member states. For example, um, solar physics was especially developed in Belarus. And that allows, this kind of division allowed um, um, to, to develop a kind of cohesion between Soviet Union's member states based on the administration of um, scientific, uh, scientific research, depending on various disciplines. The second point is the Eurasian Economic Union and its related industrial clusters, which could be an interesting base for a common space organization in Eastern Europe. As you may, um, as you may know as well, um, maybe you heard about this famous sentence uh, of Vladimir Putin from uh, 2014 in a talk um, when he explained that the Eurasian Economic Union aim to do better than the European Union in five years instead of 50 years. Um, because the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union 
where, well, based on the regulation of economic affairs, and as you know it, the European Union became a political organization regulating um, relationships between its member states much beyond economic affairs. Uh, so the Eurasian Economic Union may be a base for industrial um, activities which would be needed for a space organization at uh, a regional scale in Eastern Europe. The third kind of ingredient would be, as I said, the UN regional groups, uh, which could serve as an institutional base for a space organization at a regional scale. Because UN, uh, UN already have um, um, institutional frames well established, so why, why shouldn't we use uh, those frames established to, I mean, in the administration of space affairs also? So now, how would this Eastern European Space Organization uh, be structured? Yeah, I will skip that part because I think I will not have the time, but we could go on this question in the questions answer part. Um, and maybe the Human Space Agency could help in the organization of this Eastern Human Space Organization um, regarding the splitting of technical infrastructures. As you know, I think so. Uh, ESA is organized with several USACs, so users uh, support operation centers, which are uh, split all around uh, ESA's member states. And each USAC is specialized in a certain, uh, in a specific disciplinary field, just like uh, Institute of Research at the time of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Uh, for example, the CANMOS in Toulouse in France is specialized in physiology, so a scientist or a scientific team which would like to to lead an experiment, for example, for the International Space Station in physiology, uh, will be uh, directly put in contact in t with uh, operators from the CANMOS. So that kind of organizations uh, based on um, a technical division of labor among different member states could be, um, I mean, is already useful in the cohesion of an intergovernmental agency, such as ESA, but also for an intergovernmental um, organization, such as the Eastern Human Space Organization, if that's ever developed. Um, the point of this presentation is to say that we often talk about um, social and economic um, benefits of space activities, but there is also politics, um, political, um, political input in sustainable development regarding the way states, but also intergovernmental agencies and organizations um, are framed and then structures relationships between member states and how uh, this influences um, the way each nation states would organize um, its public policies in various fields. So an organization like, again, this is theoretical, just theoretical, but an organization like an Eastern Human Space Organization would have uh, then several kind of benefits and will also um, support some of the SDGs um, outlined by the United Nations. I will not repeat them because they are listed, but um, there will be, I don't know if you can see something, but um, there will be several outputs I already mentioned, like in political governance and UN SDGs, but also developing jobs, uh, obviously. Um, for example, the Human Space Agency and Roscosmos both are about uh, 200,000 people. So I let you imagine what, uh, how many jobs uh, an organization like the Eastern Human Space Organization could create. Um, they would also, that would also have um, outputs in outreach and education. For example, if 
such a, an international organization uh, is ever developed in Eastern Europe. Um, that would um, allow countries which are not especially involved in space activities and especially in fields like human space exploration, uh, which may be the less affordable but may be the most inspirational um, spatial areas in space affairs. That would allow countries um, which are not involved in human space exploration to contribute to to human spaceflight at a regional scale or at an intergovernmental scale, just like the European Space Agency, for example. Um, and that was the point of the slide I, I skipped about um, contributing to reducing inequalities within the cosmonaut and astronaut profession. Um, so to go back at my two first questions about uh, the relevance to develop a political governance patterns uh, upon the way we organize space science and space technology, um, and the question of a regional administration of space programs. I will not um, go further into details because of a lack of time, but we could talk about it later if you want. Um, actually, there is already a kind of uh, precedent for those two questions. Um, this is the Human Space Research Organization, which was uh, one of the two organizations which led to the development of the European Space Agency. Um, it's precedent because, as you may already know, the European Space uh, Research Organization was led by a network of scientists, European scientists, um, including uh, researchers such as uh, Harry Macy, uh, promoting a political organization, uh, a way to administrate space affairs based on scientific values and um, only based on the production of scientific knowledge. So the point was to promote um, a kind of governance uh, without bad political interests, let's say, and the ironic part was that uh, Harry Macy was during the, the war involved in the, the Manhattan Project, but this is maybe anecdotic. And there is an, another um, example of um, model of political governance based on science. Maybe you heard about it. It's uh, the project of Asgardia, the first space nation. So the project of Asgardia is um, an international project, the first space nation, but without any national boundaries, so gathering people from various countries uh, of the earth. And the, the origin point of Asgardia was to, to be led uniquely by uh, scientists, so just as the, the European Space uh, Research Organization I introduced earlier. Um, how much time do I have? Again? Yeah, this is good. Okay, so I can finish now, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I was very clear about the point of this Eastern Cuban Space Organization, but it was um, about introducing um, so two, 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 two questions which could lead to two kind of recommendations from a political scientist point of view, which is, um, do we still need um, governmental space agencies at national scales regarding the fact that uh, times are changing and not only in the space sectors um, with um, the increasing role of uh, diverse actors, including the private sectors. Uh, so the question is about how could we um, effectively administrate the future of space programs and do we still need uh, to do that on national scales or wouldn't it be more relevant to, to think about broader approaches, international intergovernmental approaches and um, such, such organizations would then be based on 
the political and social consequences of uh, the administration of space science and space technology again. So I will stop there. Thank you. Спасибо. Какие вопросы будет? Пожалуйста. Пожалуйста. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Um, it it's looks like it's definitely future. So in terms of time frame, what is your expectations when we have that sort of close cooperation between space agencies and organizations and the regions? You're talking about 10 years, 20 years, or 100 years. Thank you. Actually, that's a question I will ask to you also, <laughs> because I have no idea, and that's a, a question I could not answer to as, a, as an academician, I think. Um, maybe that would be more a question for uh, UN USA representatives? Maybe? Pajasta. I answer the question and I ask a question. I say 20 years. Happy? Um, but that's my personal opinion, of course. Um, the question is why Eastern European, did you think, would you think this theoretical model, as you highlighted it, would be possible to apply to some other regions where this might be a requirement? Um, this is also one of the questions I would like to ask to you. I base my presentation on Eastern Europe because um, this is my um, expertise field since I make a PhD research uh, on Cuban and Russian human space programs, so I learned uh, the Eastern Europe uh, space history, I would say, uh, and I don't have enough knowledge about um, space programs in Central or South America, for example, but the question I was, um, I I'm really wondering if the, that kind of model could be also implemented uh, for GULAC or other UN regional groups. I, I think so, but it would, uh, it would be useful to to make some studies on space history regarding uh, yeah, institutional path dependency. Uh, good morning, I'm Tasha. Um, I just want to say that f uh, from Africa, we see that most of the African countries don't have national space programs yet, and most of them are only starting to think about putting them up. And on the other hand, we have uh, the African Union, which is busy with the African, you know, establishing, uh, thinking about establishing a, a s on that level, uh, on a country level. So would you say that maybe this is, uh, that is the best way to do it? Or maybe we have, the countries also need to still focus on doing it on a national, national level before we, c before we can succeed on a country level. Uh, thank you very much for your questions and remarks. I really hope so. Um, I, I think so, actually. Because that was the point of a part of my presentation that um, some countries are not especially involved in space affairs, so they don't have developed um, um, technical qualifications and so on, which are used to to space programs. So that kind of regional organizations maybe could could help to to do so. And I think that uh, indeed the, the African Union you mentioned could could serve an, uh, as an institutional firm, just as um, UN regional groups, because it's already an institutional firm uh, regulating international affairs between its member states. So this is um, already um, a political organization with an institutional order on which we could um, take uh, a basis. Let's say I think so. Спасибо. Давайте мы тогда продолжим. Следующий доклад Роджер Мария Сеси из Филиппин. Прошу. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference to UNOSA and uh, Samara University for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the experience that we have in the Philippines in crafting a national space agency. So I wear many hats, but for today I'll be wearing the hat of uh, as a representative of the Department of Science and Technology, uh, wherein I am a consultant in uh, promo uh, pushing for the creation of the Philippine Space Agency. So just a brief overview of our, Philipp uh, of our country, in case you're not familiar. So we're a s the Philippines is a small group of islands located in the Southeast Asian region. Where we have a few of them, about 7,641. And our population is about 105 million, or about 75% of the population of Russia. But our land area is only 300,000, which is square kilometers, which is about 2% of uh, the land area of Russia. So it, uh, it's, a wa it's a one of the, the densest pop uh, countries with the highest population density. And we speak a lot of, uh, we speak Filipino and, and, Eng and English. And we're unique in Asia because we're the only predominantly Christian nation in Asia. Um, we're located along the Pacific ring, ring of Fire and we have a tropical uh, maritime climate. So that means half of the year, the uh, weather looks like this, sunny beaches, half of the year, it's typhoon, like it's the last thing that's going to happen. So we have about 20 typhoons a year. So being located in the Pacific Ring of Fire and at the same time experiencing 20 typhoons a year is a very big problem for the Philippines, especially when it comes to disaster management and uh, disaster risk reduction. In the past, I, I'll I'm saying here pre-2013, which uh, you would know why later, uh, there has been a lot of space activities in the Philippines. Uh, as early as 1800s, we've been doing astronomy. In the 1970s, we even have a rocket or a missile development program. We've been a member of UN COPERA since two th 1997. In uh, sorry, 1977, I should say. In 1997, Aguila 2 was launched, which was the very first geostationary satellite of the Philippines. We participated in Sentinel Asia, and we even submitted a proposed bill in 2012 for the creation of a Philippine Space Agency. In terms of international space treaties, we are signatory, but we did not ratify uh, the Outer Space Treaty, the Rescue Agreement, and li the Liability Convention. However, we ratified, and I don't know why, the uh, Moon Treaty, uh, which I don't know what happened there, why we ratified this treaty and not the other three. Okay. Uh, in terms of a turning point, uh, apolog uh, there are two turning points in the year of 2012-2013. The first one was what we call the Scarborough Shoal Standoff, which was an ish one of the disputed islands in uh, Spratly, which is in the western part of the Philippines. But what is more crucial or critical is uh, in 2013, Typhoon Haiyan, or Typhoon Yolanda, as we locally call it, struck the Philippines. So this is one of the strongest typhoons that hit uh, land, and it caused a uh, casualty of more than two, uh, 6,000 uh, people and displaced almost a million inhabitants in the central Philippine region. Because of this, uh, sorry. Going back, because of Typhoon Haiyan and the widespread discussion, uh, d destruction, uh, we re that's where we experience the lack of communication, the lack of access to uh, the regions or to the areas that needs uh, disaster relief. So that's that became a turning point for the government because we, we realized that it's important for us to start investing in space technology in order to prevent events such as this in the future. So in starting from 2013, the f uh, Department of Science and Technology has been very uh, aggressive in pushing for the creation of the Philippine Space Agency, but we had to do it in a more systematic manner, wherein uh, we have to think what we want to achieve and we want uh, we have to think what is going on or we have to look at what is going on around in the region also so the first thing that we did was we crafted a baseline research study to assess what are the assets what are the infrastructure what are the human resources available in the country that are, that is related to space after that, uh, we crafted the National Space Development and Utilization Policy, so we analyzed the various space programs and space policies of different countries and tried to see which ones would be applicable or would fit the uh, situation in the Philippines. 
We even conducted a multi-sectoral stakeholders from academe, from industry, from government, even from the defense sector, in order for them to have inputs in the space policy. We, in 2014, we also started one of our very first uh, technical collaborations with Japan, uh, wherein we launched, uh, we developed the Diwata microsatellite. So we skipped the CubeSat nanosat phase. We went direct towards the microsatellite. So the Dewata is a 50 kilogram microsatellite and one of them is orbiting now and the other is scheduled for launch next year. In 2015, we uh, uh, the DUST funded the National Space Development Program which wherein we conducted a cost-benefit analysis and established the key roadmaps of uh, space programs and we fostered, we tried to foster international cooperations and partnerships. And then in 2016, uh, we started lobbying for the creation of the Philippine Space Agency to our politicians and decision makers. Why did we wait until 2016, or even if we had them ready by 2014? It's because 2016, we had a change in presidency, so we had to wait for that uh, to happen before doing anything else. So one of the key outputs or results of the baseline research was that we, s we learned that we need to have a national space policy first before the creation of Philippine Space Agency. Otherwise, it would not be uh, very productive to have a space agency without a clear mandate or a clear direction on what, is, what it is going to do in the future. So th that's the biggest takeaway coming from that study. We engaged numerous stakeholders, almost everyone that's going to benefit or going to be affected by space applications and services. We included them in the consul uh, consultation so that they would have a sense of, they would have inputs in the space policy and in a way they would also gain a sense of ownership to the space policy itself. So they're like, we, we made them our allies. In when we crafted the policy, we identified what we call six key development areas that were uh, that are very important. Uh, it's a quite a substantial, uh, long document, but uh, the six key development area focuses on national security and development, hazard management and climate studies, space research and development, space industry capacity building, space education and awareness, and finally international cooperation. So. These uh, six key DAs are the framework of the Philippine space policies, wherein all subsequent programs or projects are going to be or should be aligned to these to any of these three uh, six key DAs. And also, in, as I mentioned earlier, in 2014, uh, we started with the Diwata program, which was launched from the Kibo module of the International Space Station. So this is Diwata. Uh, it was launched on April 27, 2016, and right now, uh, Diwata 2, which is uh, almost a similar size of satellite, is undergoing mission planning and is, uh, is under development actually, and it's scheduled for launch in 2018 or 2019. As part of the Diwata pro program, or parallel to the Diwata program, we also established the Philippine Earth Data Resources Observatory wherein uh, this serves as the main ground receiving station for the microsatellite. And at the same time, it receives also signals or data coming from CompSat 3 and CompSat 5 of Korea. And as of the moment, uh, where the Pedro, or the ground station, is open to uh, accepting other uh, uh, countries or proposals who wants to use their uh, ground station to download or downlink data. In the National Space Development Program, we crafted, uh, so the task was to lay the groundwork for the Philippine Space Agency. So we did a cost-benefit study, which established the ROI and the budget needed for a long-term space program. We established the roadmaps, such as the National Space Research and Development Agenda, the Satellite Development Roadmap, which over the next 10 years, the Philippines is going to launch five more satellites. These are based all from stake, uh, uh, consultations from stakeholders. Uh, we even created the satellite data sharing and management policy uh, to address how data is going to be shared between academic entities, commercial entities, and even the security aspect of data sharing. 
And finally, we established the space industry development roadmap where we identified four niche areas for the Philippines, namely space subsystems production, satellite AIT, space applications and services, and the most long term in the program, probably 15, 20 years down the line, is launch vehicle services. So 2016 was a very big year for the Philippines. As I mentioned earlier, we launched the Diwata microsatellite. But in addition to that, uh, we even started the legislation or the creation of the Philippine Space Agency. And we even hosted the 23rd Asia-Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. So despite the lack of a space agency, we're hosting a space agency forum. So this is one of the largest, atte most attended APRSAF meetings. I think it's the second largest. So on the policy or in the legislation aspect, so we, one of our tasks in the NSDP was to talk to congressmen and to talk to senators and to make them understand the value of space uh, development and why the Philippines, which is a developing country, needs it, wherein it, even if it, it is faced with other problems such as uh, poverty, disaster, and so on and so forth. So in September six, uh, 2016, the very first bill was filed, which was uh, House Bill 3637. And subsequently, four other bills were filed in the next few months. Although in terms of content, all the, other, all the four bills are similar. In, this, in the Senate side, so because the Congress is the lower house, the Senate is the upper house, the first bill was filed in October 2016 and another bill was filed in December uh, 2016. Okay? So, uh, but this, this is very much similar to what was, uh, or the similar to the version of the Congress. In this year, just this year alone, there has been a significant amount of development in terms of legislation. So the National Space Program in early January was presented to the President Rodrigo Duterte, and it was actually approved. So that means it's part of the mandate of his administration. So the budget of approximately around uh, approximately 500 million is going to be allocated for the next 10 years for space development in the country. So, and then the bills underwent uh, scrutiny by the technical working group of the lower house of Congress. And we even had a, an ocular visit to the future site of a Philippine Space Agency. So we already identified where this space, Philippine Space Agency is going to be built and how large it is. It's actually a 30 hectare facility. And uh, we, together with the congressman, uh, so yeah, congressman, we did a benchmarking study in JAXA in Japan, which is one of our closest collaborators. Uh, we visited JAXA, uh, saw their facility and how they operate. Uh, space agency, and just last October, the final version was submitted to Congress as to the House Committee for Science and Technology, and it's now transmitted to the plenary. So that's the big hall where everything is being approved. So all of those happen in one year only. But what is what is more critical, or what is more important, are these two documents. Uh, the Philippine Development Plan for 2017 to 2022, which is the, uh, the development plan of the Duterte administration. And inside the Philippine Development Plan, it ident specifically identified the creation of a Philippine Space Agency as one of the uh, flagship programs in terms of science and technology for the current administration. So that's a very important piece of document. And the other one is national security policy, also for 2017 to 2022, wherein it identified the creation of a space industry in the Philippines is uh, as a vital instrument for national security. And currently, it's being discussed to be included also in the Legislative Development Advisory Council, or what we call uh, LEDAC, which identifies the priority bills of the administration. So. On the public side, we, since 2016, we've been very aggressive, or very, uh, we started promoting space uh, to in various form online. We even have print. Uh, so this is one of the Sunday magazines of uh, one of the biggest broadsheets in the Philippines. And there's a special issue on why we need the space program. And if you are familiar with Jollibee, Jollibee is uh, the competitor of McDonald's in the Philippines. It's more popular than McDonald's, and they have uh, space-themed commercials recently. In so it, and the same with Nido, which is a milk uh, 
uh, product. So it shows you how it's slowly being trickled down to this consciousness of the public or how space is being trickled down to the consciousness of the public. Other space, yeah, yes, uh, almost finished. So other space-related activities, we have a space science program, we are part of the BIRDS2, we have a TAN satellite competition, uh, no, we're going to be part of the NovaSAR satellite, we've, we've established MOUs with JAXA, UK Space Agency, and even Roscosmos, and there's a cooperation by DSWD and Inmarsat as part of the UK Space Agency. Future developments, uh, we're now in, in undergoing, uh, we now offer scholarship programs, we're launching the Rata 2, we finalized the locations, and we're lobbying for uh, the space agency. So just some recommendations for our emerging space countries, or space nations, on how you, you can do it based on the experience that we had. First, conduct a baseline study and assessment on what do you have in the country, and assess, uh, study the different space policies and assess which ones are going to be applicable to your own country. Involve as many agencies and sectors as you can because these are the guys who are going to help you in pushing for the space agency. Have a small but dedicated team that would do most of the work. In fact, the National Space Development Program has only about five, five to seven people working on it and the long term, have a long-term perspective. So educate politicians, have minimal exposure initially to the public, but ramp it up later on, and cooperate with space fink and space emerging nations, and include space law and policy at the very early stage of your development, and be prepared for a long bumpy ride. So with that, I end my talk with this short quote, which is an African proverb. So if you want to go fast, go along, but now, we're at the stage that we want to go further, so that's why we need to go together, and the Philippines is very much open to collaborations to all countries in the world. Thank you very much. Спасибо вам хорошую презентацию. Вопросы? Do you have a national uh, a center for early warning system and disaster management, or in the future? Uh, actually, we have a National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council, which which handles uh, disaster-related activities. So we work with them, we talk to them on how space technology can be uh, used for disaster assessment and dis uh, risk reduction. But it's in a different department. It's under the Department of National Defense. Okay. Спасибо. Да. Следующий доклад сопредседатель Денис Раков из э, биомедицинских проблем Российской Академии Наук России. Пожалуйста. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги и организаторы конференции. На первых стадиях развития пилотируемой космонавтики возникло два вопроса. Первый вопрос. Возможно ли существование в условиях космического пространства биологических объектов? И второй вопрос. Когда, э, как долго мы можем существовать в условиях космического полета? С для решения этих задач и этих вопросов были поставлены э, следующие научные э, исследования для, э, про, прошу прощения, а для решения этих задач были сформированы следующие программы. Это полеты на ракетах, полеты на модифицированных космических аппаратах «Восток» и далее это программа «Бион» и «Фотон». А для ответа на первый вопрос э, были проведены работы на собаках, которые показали, что э, в условиях космического полета биологические объекты могут существовать. Первые полеты были достаточно короткие и не позволяли выявить тех изменений, которые э, были обнаружены впоследствии по программе Бион. Вот э, здесь представлена вся программа Бион, начиная с 1973 года по 1996 э, год. Проведен огромный объем исследований, накоплен огромный материал по влиянию космической радиации и факторов космического полета на биологические объекты. Основная э, задача, поставленная перед проектом Бион, 
была решена. Была создана э, медико-биологическая программа обеспечения космических полетов. Проект Бион М номер один был запущен в 2006 году. После прохождения эскизного проекта с 2008 года э, началась реализация этого проекта. И в 2013 году космический аппарат стартовал с космодрома Байконур. На орбите он находился в течение 30 суток. И в мае 2013 года была осуществлена посадка в районе Оренбургской области Российской Федерации. Космический аппарат состоит из нескольких э, частей. Это и приборная отсек, агрегатная отсек, спускаемый аппарат. На спускаемом аппарате э, есть платформа средств введения, на которой могут размещаться малоразмерные космические аппараты. Изготовитель космического аппарата э, – акционерное общество «Ракетно-космический центр «Прогресс». За реализацию научной программы исследований отвечает Российская академия наук и, в частности, Институт медико-биологических проблем. Здесь вы можете посмотреть э, компоновку научной аппаратуры и размещение ее внутри спускаемого аппарата. Сама научная аппаратура может быть как внутри, так и снаружи космического аппарата. Основные направления исследований э, на, по программе БИОН – это исследования по гравитационной биологии и физиологии, экзобиологии, радиационной биологии, дозиметрии, фармакологии и биотехнологии. На фотографиях представлена та аппаратура, которая летала на космическом аппарате БИОН М номер один. Для реализации этой программы исследований была создана большая научно-техническая кооперация, в которую входили институты Российской Академии Наук, институты Российской Академии Наук и ведущие научные э, университеты нашей страны. Помимо этого в программе приняли участие наши зарубежные партнеры из Украины, Германии, Соединенных Штатов, Франции. Южной Кореи и Японии. Здесь представлена организация работ по проекту на космодроме и в лабораториях. Все эксперименты прошли через комиссию по биоэтике Института медико-биологических проблем. Комиссия является одной из комиссий Организации Объединенных Наций по биоэтике. Все исследования на животных были одобрены, и только после одобрения этой комиссии мы могли проводить данные исследования в полете и после полета. На данном слайде представлена информация о том, как проходило получение биоматериала на месте посадки. Нам потребовалось создать специальный лабораторный модуль, который собирается на месте посадки. Вот он так, прошу прощения. Значит, он состоит из нескольких модулей, в котором размещаются научные аппаратуры и могут работать при различных условиях от минус 30 до плюс 50 специалисты. На верхних фотографиях черно-белых представлены ранее работы по проекту Бион номер по проекту Бион. Основной вывод из проекта Био номер один – это нам удалось наконец-то восстановить всю ту инфраструктуру, которая была в Советском Союзе. Мы создали наземную стендовую базу, подготовили молодых специалистов для реализации этой программы. И сейчас у нас стоит следующая задача – реализацию проекта Био номер два, который будет запущен в 2022 году. Полеты будут приблизительно похожи. Единственное отличие это будет э, в том, что впервые в мире будет запущен космический аппарат в автоматическом режиме с биологическими объектами на высоту до 1000 километров. Это наш сайт информационный, посвященный проекту Бион. Здесь вы можете познакомиться с историей проекта, с действующими программами. Есть информация по видео, по фото о тех проектах э, и по науке, которые были реализованы. На данном слайде представлена российская программа исследований. 
на автоматических космических аппаратов и международной космической станции, где мы можем проводить исследования по гравитационной биологии, физиологии, дозиметрии. В настоящий момент реализуется программа Бион номер два. В федеральную космическую программу заложено исследование на космическом аппарате Возврат МКА. Он будет в перспективе летать по высокоэллиптической орбите с высотой 200 тысяч километров. Как я уже говорил, основная нагрузка уложится на ракетно-космический центр по изготовлению самого космического аппарата и созданию всей наземной инфраструктуры. За научную программу отвечает Институт медико-биологических проблем. Мы вас всех приглашаем к участию в наших экспериментах. Надеемся, что ваш вклад и наш вклад будет очень полезен в реализацию будущих пилотируемых полетов. На следующий год у нас запланирована конференция, посвященная памяти Олегу Георгиевичу Газенку. Это один из основателей космической биологии и медицины. На сайте института будет представлена информация. Мы приглашаем вас к участию в этом мероприятии. Будет очень интересно. И много будет докладов из прошлого и будущего. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. Какие будут вопросы? Вопросов нет? А, пожалуйста. Вот. И там на фотографии, по-моему, только мыши были, да, или крысы? Рэдс. Ну, вот самый последний запуск. Самый последний был э, на мышах, на мышах. Угу. Э, монгольские песчанки, микроорганизмы э, и амфибии. Угу. Yes. Спасибо. Yes, пожалуйста. пожалуйста. Один вопрос. Какие проблемы вы видите, которые наиболее важны на полет человека к Марсу в результате ваших исследований, на полет, полет на Луны и так далее? Какие самые, самые серьезные проблемы, которые надо решать в будущем? Ну, самая серьезная проблема – это не на чем лететь. Это первое. Как только будет сформирована основная научная программа, как будет понятна цели и задачи полета на Марс, и отсюда можно уже исходить создание космического аппарата и так далее. Вот. А проблем действительно очень много, начиная от психологии, чисто технических проблем, биомедицинских. В большей степени биология и медицина, конечно, готова, но есть некоторые нюансы, которые необходимо изучать. Это и радиация, и сочетанное действие гравитации и радиации, и проблемы по формированию экипажа, которые необходимо решать в наземных экспериментах. Вот в частности, у нас будет в институте эксперимент, проходил в институте эксперимент Марс 500, в которых решались психологические проблемы. Сейчас стартует эксперимент в Сириус, в котором будет экипаж из шести человек, трое мужчин, трое женщин. И в дальнейшем как бы, эксперименты эти необходимо проводить как можно чаще, для того, чтобы выяснять те проблемы, которые будут не только при перелете, при перелете на другую планету, но и при приземлении на Марс или на Луну и создании там определенных условий для людей. Есть проблемы систем жизнеобеспечения, которые к сожалению, сейчас не так актуальны. Но они имеют э, очень важное значение, поскольку без систем жизнеобеспечения лететь на другую планету будет невозможно. Пожалуйста. Еще один вопрос, извините. но а Как вы скомментируете последние исследования американцев, Американской космической агенции о модификации человеческого генома в результате длительного полета в космосе? Там был, было исследование на два, два астронавта-близнецы, которые один был в космосе, а другой стоял на Земле, а потом они сравнивали, там, как у них теломеры, по-моему, это называется, эти, эти части ДНК, которые там поменялись вследствие космического полета. Вы видите, это как проблема и как долгосрочная проблема на существование человека в космосе. Мне сложно э, ответить на ваш вопрос, поскольку я не знаком детально с теми материалами, которые были опубликованы американскими специалистами. Но проблемы, наверное, существуют, раз их поднимают. Наверное, надо как-то их решать. Спасибо. Спасибо.
Следующее выступление у нас э, Владимир Сычев, Институт биомедицинских проблем Российской Академии Наук. И обращение английский. Да? К сожалению, Владимир Николаевич не смог приехать. Вместо Владимира Николаевича будет выступать Андреев Андреевский, Александр Александрович. Hello, uh, I'm also working for IMBMP, and uh, as uh, Denise has already told, I'm, uh, I will replace our boss, Vladimir Sichov, who could to make this presentation and to co-chair this session. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Denise had told you about the previous uh, Bion flights, and I'm going to tell you, well, uh, an outline of going to happen uh, at Bion M2. Uh, what makes this talk re uh, relevant for this uh, meeting is that, first of all, it uh, deals with the uh, future, because uh, anyway, uh, most, of, most of the people dream or uh, want to go to Mars or other planets, and uh, that makes necessary the biomedical research to support it. Uh, and it was one of the questions for the previous presentation. and. Uh, Mm, next, it uh, deals with the first present uh, the first talk, which was about the Soviet uh, system and uh, Soviet scientific approach to these studies. And finally, uh, Bayern was uh, throughout the twelve flights that happened, and uh, uh, hopefully the next flight will be the same was always a good example of cooperation between different nations in uh, scientific studies. Because even through throughout the Cold War, we uh, always worked with the NASA uh, scientists, with scientists from other countries. So Bayern uh, has always been and still remains uh, an example of good cooperation in uh, space. Mm. Uh, so the previous flight was in 1913, somewhere here. So and initially the second flight was uh, scheduled for somewhere between 18, then it was 1920, now it's 22. There's a series of delays and uh, hopefully this date is uh, more or less final. Um, Denise had already told you that uh, these three Bionem uh, flights are, well, it's a kind of series of experiments uh, joined with one goal to establish what happens to living organisms in uh, far space, so not uh, on the low Earth orbit. Because uh, <coughs> it answers uh, the question why it is all needed, because it's a very expensive and tiresome task to perform these studies. But uh, we still, uh, well, now we know that uh, we can support humans on uh, low Earth orbit for prolonged periods of, periods of time. Uh, everyone has heard about a uh, recent flight of one year duration on ISS. Perhaps some of you know that it didn't reach by some hundred days the record breaking, the record setting flight uh, of a Soviet uh, cosmonaut some te uh, almost 20 years ago. <coughs> so uh, the outcomes of the Bayern program were the uh, countermeasures that are needed, needed to support humans uh, on low Earth orbit. Now when we plan to go into other planets, we have to know what happens to our body, because nobody knows that for sure. Uh, the question was about the telomeres, uh, there might be many other issues, and uh, the most obvious is that when people uh, come to land on a different planet after a prolonged period of f f space flight, they might just not be able to work there, and they are supposed to work. So we have to find some ways to um, to m to, uh, to keep the fitness for just performing their tasks as scientists or just building a base or whatever. So uh, to do that, uh, it was organized uh, by the Russian Academy of Sciences. So the Academy established a kind of commissions to, uh, commission to uh, select the uh, so it's a, uh, select experiments for this flight. 
I, uh, it was needed primarily for technical needs because uh, it's not exactly uh, experience proper, I would say. So it's more a set of uh, hardware which had to be determined quite early in the <coughs> development of the program to be able to, deve to develop the hardware and to produce it. So, and uh, there was quite a list of uh, proposals uh, of which uh, 27 were selected. Uh, some of them are dealing with animals and I will speak more about that because it's well, uh, probably the most interesting part. Uh, and quite a range of experiments with plants, microorganisms and uh, well, other life science related or even unrelated like physical experiments. <laughs> so some experiments were uh, d uh, rejected uh, and uh, what also makes relevant, uh, this talk relevant is that quite a range of experiments were uh, suggested by uh, research organizations from Samara and Tsiska uh, Beprakas, uh, who is our host actually. Uh, so uh, speaking about experiments with animals, who are the which are the cornerstone of this mission. So these black mice will be the main object. And uh, the, j the aim is uh, put very widely. So uh, the idea is to study the combined effects of space radiation and microgravity on a uh, living body and to be able to compare these results to the, uh, to the results of the first flight because uh, it was performed on lower orbit, <coughs> not like the second one, which will be at much higher uh, orbit, like 1,000 kilometers with higher radiation exposure. So, uh, uh, actually, there will be two uh, complementary experiments, one with uh, um, more, um, more similar to the Bion one flight, the other is uh, more directed to the future, because we want to develop a new system of uh, support uh, of animals in space, and uh, I should add, I should add that it's a pretty tricky task to support uh, an automated mission of 30 days uh, in space. So it's a kind of robot. Nobody has ever done that before, because uh, uh, you know that lots of experiments are performed, but they are always man attended. This is quite different. So the uh, hardware was all automatic. It uh, fed the animals, uh, kept them clean, and so on, and also made l quite a lot of measurements. So uh, here's a brief overview of what it looks like. So we have some flying animals, some uh, animals on Earth uh, which are used as controls. Uh, this is another control group which, uh, which is kept in the, uh, in the animal facility and uh, enables us to compare to uh, to compare the impact of uh, the flight hardware because of of course it affects the animal and the flight plus uh, the hardware uh, to normal mice who are just living their normal life. So uh, the animals will be prepared for the flight and uh, it's quite a long. Uh, preparatory procedure, most like for the cosmonauts, so they are trained to live together, to eat the space food, to perform some tasks, uh, so that we'll be able to compare them, perf the performance after the flight to the pre-flight values, and so on. <coughs> uh, and the areas of research are almost everything, so it's primarily the CNS and uh, central nervous system and sensory systems, muscles as usual with uh, and bones, is it is always a must for spaceflight experiments, fluid electrical balance and uh, water uh, turnover and cardiovascular system. Uh, initially, we were considering to uh, do something about gender differences and to use both males and females. Uh, then it was decided against for some scientific reasons, which are unrelevant. Now we are underway with uh, testing the new equipment which is developed for mice. It was performed this summer, if you might see. Uh, so these are the mice, quite happy in the end of the experiment. So uh, speaking about the cooperation, so even now when we uh, the proper program of scientific experiments with mice is uh, just being developed, we have a list of uh, applications from 
NASA uh, dif from different universes, uh, universities and uh, supported by NASA, uh, from uh, French space agency, uh, again a list of universities and supported by CNES from Italy, uh, several universities uh, and the Italian space agency. From Germany, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, China and Finland, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, once the review, pro uh, the review process will be over, so a list of experiments will be selected that can be feasibly, that are feasible for this uh, flight. Then uh, speaking about other experiments except mice, so it will uh, will also have uh, fruit flies, uh, and uh, the experiments will be aimed at uh, studying. Uh, how do these small creatures uh, feel the lack of gravity? Because, uh, as you know, that the smaller the organism is, uh, the less it is affected by gravity or its absence. So no one knows why do uh, why are cells or fruit flies affected by lack of gravity at all. So it's easy. It, that's why it's interesting to use uh, fruit flies, for instance, or cells. <coughs> Uh, there will be a list of uh, experiments with cells, with uh, bl um, blood cells precursors and some others. Uh, and just I will list through a range of experiments with algae, uh, plant seeds. Uh, some of them are suggested by some other entities. You can see that quite a lot. Uh, I will briefly stop on this one because I like it. So uh, it was performed on Bionum 1 where a uh, stone uh, kind of uh, mock-up uh, meteorite was uh, uh, placed on the outside of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, some bacteria were placed inside this stone and uh, we were greatly surprised to find out that some of them still live after a long space flight and coming back to Earth uh, on the outside of the spacecraft with uh, all the temperature and whatever during descent. So, uh, which makes us think that uh, finally the life could be brought to Earth uh, from outer space. So, some other experiments, uh, again, uh, some of them will be uh, crystal, uh, bio more biochemical and physical. Pardon. So I will skip that and finish with thanking you for your attention. Пожалуйста, вопрос. Have you thought of any experiments where a complete life cycle can be tested? Uh, chain. What do you mean complete life cycle? Uh, you have few organisms which can survive without any external things for long time reproduction and all those things. So uh, there were mm, such experiments were performed. Some of them, well, for instance, some of the organisms lived for a prolonged period of time on the outside of the spray spacecraft. Then, well, those that are dormant, and uh, I can't remember the English name, uh, whatever, so uh, small arthropods. Then they could, uh, after the after they were brought back, they could still live. And uh, the other example is, again, the fruit flies, which were uh, reproduced for several generations on, not on bion, but on photon uh, flights, so with not without consequences, because they had quite a lot of changes in epigenetics and so on. So some reproduction-oriented experiments are performed. Пожалуйста. Congratulations for your presentation. Uh, I would like to know I mean, the difficulties uh, regarding setting up the experiments between the scientists, 
and the engineers that developed I mean, the spacecraft and the experiments itself? Um, well, you, you, I've already told you that it's quite a challenge to support uh, living mice in space uh, in an automated uh, spacecraft. And uh, when you work with engineers, it's always a bit of pulling the uh, cover to each side, but finally we managed to do that. And uh, you have to go both ways to meet because uh, you can't perform a technically unfeasible experiment. And so, but still, you have to ask for a lot of things from the engineers. So it's challenging for everyone. But it's manageable. That's why, by the way, this long time for preparation because it takes a lot of time to do the equipment and to test it and so on. Спасибо. Еще есть вопрос? Спасибо. У нас еще, еще два доклада. Следующий доклад Гана Пазу из Индии. Университет Вид. Пожалуйста. Um. Very good afternoon. Uh, so my topic is going to be a little different from whatever you're talking about last uh, three days. Uh, this is uh, more of application side. Uh, the role of uh, uh, integrating the social media and the space technology for the disaster quick response systems. Uh, uh, social media is nowadays, you know, it's very popular, uh, particularly in India. Uh, we, India is the largest country, one of the largest countries. We have 1.324 uh, billion people. And out of that, we have more than 50% of the people, is less than 25 years, and more than 65% of the people, is pop you know, population is, uh, you know, um, uh, youngsters in less than 35 years. So. Uh, the huge number of population they are using the, the social media uh, like WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook uh, for many good things. Like, you know, we want to grab this uh, new technology, the new social media involvement in particularly the saving the lives. That is our ultimate aim of uh, our thing. And uh, so I'm just giving two examples like how uh, we are addressing here the two, three problems like, you know, uh, the uh, disasters and the quick response in urban areas, how the technology, space technology and applications used, and uh, how it is not, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a gap in uh, rural areas and uh, and the other problems, what we faced during some of the major disasters. We, I, I uh, really involved in these disasters, particularly in um, uh, handling this. Uh, this is one of the disasters in 2015 uh, called South Indian Flood. Uh, like uh, Philippines, um, uh, this time we had a huge flood. You can see this picture like uh, this is the area called uh, Chennai city. The Chennai city is like um, 7 million population, what we have like 170 square kilometer. A small city with uh, 7 point, uh, uh, about 7.3 million population. Almost half of the population got affected during the flood. And um, so what happened during um, uh, during November 9 to 16, there was a huge rainfall all over the state. Uh, the state is like covering an area of 130,000 kilo square kilometer area. And uh, uh, we have about 70 million population in that uh, state. The whole state got, uh, you know, hu huge rain. And uh, then later on again on November 29, there was a huge rain again. And uh, already the soil gets saturated. There is no water to go out. And uh, the whole area got flooded, and almost the whole city got flooded. So the one thing is like the, the space technology, the space applications, particularly here. Like, um, uh, if you understand uh, the past, the the, the before uh, disasters, like if you uh, keep thinking on what is going on process, the uh, natural process, then you can at least mitigate this kind of disasters. The one of the things, like you know, this is the 2001. Uh, a satellite image of that particular area and this is on 2015 you can see this area is like the most of the river belts got you know encroached by the people the local public uh, and the slum area people and uh, this is in 2016 actually uh, this is the after the disasters like you know even after the disaster like you know the a lot of people get affected in this particular area they 
come over and they stay back in the same area. So they don't, they, they are reluctant to go out. And uh, the best understanding is the nature, like, you know, the river process you should understand in any, any, uh, uh, any before any disasters, like, you know, the river is as a natural process. It's uh, transport a lot of sand materials and it is deposited over here. So this is in 2015, 27, 8, this is in 8, 4, 2016. What happened during 2015 December, there was a huge flood. The water cannot, you know, uh, travel along the river because of there was a huge sediment deposited over that. The we people, the, the, the scientists or the engineers, we forgot to analyze back before monsoon. This is a lack of preparedness in before monsoon. So what happened, this whole area got choked. So when water comes, it's not going through along the river. So it has to reach back to the sea, right? So it is not going because of that. So this is the one area we want to concentrate, like the application of space technology for instead of going back and doing some response and relief activities of the, the disaster, we have to think back and do some kind of pre-disaster proactive approach. Uh, this is the one area where we are concentrating. The other one is like uh, the, this is the city map. Uh, in 1893, you can see the lot of big water bodies, like one and a half kilometer length and half a kilometer width of the water body. And you can see now, this is in 2016, like there is no lakes over here. So ultimately, when you get a rain, the all these areas constructed over the lake area, which is filled and constructed houses. So we forgot about the history. So we all sh should forget, you know, we all should know about the history of that particular area before going to uh, any development in that particular area uh, for any quick disaster, uh, you know, uh, preparedness. So what happened in this whole area? So this is the one of the lake, biggest lake. It has got filled. Because people, they do not know. The policy makers, they do not know. The people uh, who are giving permission to construct the houses, like the building authorities, they do not know. So this kind of information, like satellite information, should you know, uh, give a very clear details. Where, is, where was the lake? You should not construct the buildings on that particular lake. And uh, I'm comparing the two scenarios. Like, you know, we got some kind of data during um, emergencies uh, based on the jack side. Uh, satellites. This is given by the IWMI, International Water Management Institute. So these are all the red patches of the water of the areas. Like uh, uh, during the disasters, like immediately after any disaster, we got data from these people and we started analyzing. The good thing is like here, like, you know, we don't just see the data, so we work in the ground. So we are trying to help the people in the ground using the satellite data. That is the one area, which is the new uh, thing, like what we are doing. Uh, this is in the same thing, which is in the urban area, uh, sorry, rural area. And this is the uh, impact in the urban area, like, you know, most of you, you can just imagine how much water it is flowing. It's up to this much. Okay, in this, some of the areas, like all the roads got blocked. There is no way to go. And this is again in the rural area. The impact is almost same in urban and rural areas. And uh, you can see uh, immediately, uh, you know, uh, the people, they started working in, the people in the city, they started working and they have a lot of engineers. Uh, they started working on uh, city side, but but in the rural side, no one is ready to help and no one have a technology or no one is not uh, preparing any kind of thing. So the, what I want to say is like the space technology or any technology, it should be for all people. It's not for only for the rich people or only for the people in the city. It should be for the people in the rural and the urban, both. Because a human being is a human being, yeah, right? And uh, same thing in Nepal earthquake. Uh, we work on Nepal earthquakes. So, so there was an earthquake in Nepal in magnitude of 7.8. It killed more than 8,000 people. There is more than 21,000 people got injured in this. Uh, it's, a, it's an official record, but however, it is more than that. We have more than 50,000 people got injured, and death may be around more than 12,000 people. And uh, so here also, this is the scenario in Kathmandu. This is a major city, it's so one of the valley. You can see the structures, these are all some of the wooden structures which got totally collapsed. And these are all the structures, the poor engineered structures, like earthquake doesn't kill people, the build buildings which do. Uh, the, these are all some of the poor engineering structures. You can see uh, the earthquake doesn't leave God also. Buddha is under debris. So, and 
what we do immediately we we have a group of people uh, like you know uh, what, what we call as crisis mappers already we are working with international people so immediately of any any de major disaster we had a group in that group we'll discuss um, we'll try to get some data from the UNOSAT and we try to get us a data from this crisis mapper then immediately after this Nepal earthquake we contacted the digi globe the digital globe people they used to give the data on like the series of map after the disaster like you know immediately after the earthquake they take the data uh, real time data and send it to us and we try to map the areas like you know where, where we have the more damage which are all the areas got high you know building collapse all these things we can have a rapid damage mapping and uh, it's a high resolution satellite data this is the uh, pre disaster data and we have the post disaster data also the good thing in post disaster data like you know uh, we have a very good contact with the local people the local ngos in the nepal so uh, what i did actually um, uh, from india we triggered that satellite data for nepal and we are trying to contact with the local uh, nepal ngos so we got the data we can say like you know in this particular area what is the vehicle of your relief material is going on in that particular area and how much area got debris you know because most of the roads got blocked so you can't go by your own vehicle so where you want to go suppose if you want to go by a law you know a lorry or if you want to go by a container so we can measure the container size and tell that in that area you can go or not okay this this what the space technology is really useful during uh, the an emergency and for the quick response the next one is like you know identification of your um, uh, uh, shelters during the emergency like you know a lot of people they trying to help during the uh, earthquake like you know we had uh, friends from uh, harvard university a group of uh, doctors who came by the helicopter but they do not know the where to put their shelters where to put their medical clinics in this area so we identify the suitable sites to put their you know uh, medical clinics and we had a lot of relief materials comes you know dumping over there in the Nepal and uh, we get a lot of materials so we identified uh, the, the locations where the closest point where you can put your clinics you can put your medical points the way I'm saying all these things like you know uh, uh, the satellite technology will have a quick response you can do it everything within you know half an hour or one hour Break. So that every one hour in disaster is very, very important. So you can save a lot of people. And uh, uh, this is what we have identified a lot of shelters. So a lot of materials comes from the uh, Indian military and other military services. Uh, this is called Operation Maitri. And uh, so you can see some of the uh, you know people who got treated during the in urban areas. Again, in rural areas in Nepal, there was a huge problem because Nepal is a country where you have like you know. Uh, small small hillocks it's a valley and hillocks so you can't reach by helicopter so where we suggested like you know a lot of people the local NGOs taking their donkeys and you know serving the materials and uh, so what we did we didn't do anything very big like you know we just got the data from uh, raw data from some agencies like you know you know SAT or something like DigiGlobe and we process ourselves within a lab so I am sitting in Velour Velour is somewhere around uh, 2,000 kilometers from Nepal. I'm not in Nepal, okay? So I'm sitting in Velour. Nepal is somewhere away. And we had a good friends of, you know, my own friends from Nepal. Those friends are working in US. So, so how the social media is useful here? Like, you know, we got the data. I analyzed the data. I sent the data through internet to some of my friends in Nepal, some of my so who are working in the ground and some of my friends in the US, some of my friends in Philippines, some of my friends in UK. So those people continuously we work by 24 by 7. It means like, you know, in India, if it is daytime, in US it is nighttime. So what we do, by morning to evening I work in India and I send the data to my US friend. Uh, that US friend means they are the Nepali people, they are working in US. So those people, they work in the nighttime and they send the data to the local NGOs. The local NGOs go and serve the people there. And uh, this is what we are doing and uh, the relief operation will be very quick I, i'm just telling like you know today we are doing i'm sitting in russia i'm sending my you know a uh, lot of data to our people now now china is again get rained this time this month it's a lot of area got waterlogged i'm i'm just sitting in my room room number 624 in holiday in and sending a lot of data to my area like my students we have a facebook group tamil nadu uh, new face society it's a call 
60,000 volunteers are. You don't believe 60,000 volunteers. We start with the two students. Now it is, you know, spreaded into 60,000 people in that community. So everybody is working in the field right now. So uh, this is what we use the social media. You just need a Android mobile or iPhone with a good friends. You can do a lot of things. And the other one I want to tell you is like the modeling scenarios. Like, you know, we do a lot of, you know, modeling using space technology. But when in case of the real time, it won't match. Yeah, I'm going to finish. It won't match. So uh, be realistic. Whatever the model you are going to prepare is be realistic. And what we found is the gap between the people who are doing the space research and space application things and the users. So we want to bridge the gaps. The one thing is like you can have the capacity building of these people. So this, you know, people who are using the, you know, the space technology should be trained and uh, ultimately if you do this, we have a destination disaster risk for India. Thank you. Any questions? Спасибо за очень спасибо за очень интересную информативную презентацию. Она действительно очень нужна в при тех критических ситуациях, которые происходят не только у вас и в мире. Надеюсь, наши коллеги смогут перенять ваш опыт и внедрить подобные технологии в других странах. У кого есть вопросы? Спасибо. И у нас осталась одна презентация. Лоридана Санта. Прошу. The title of my presentation is Sustainability of in Space Manufacturing. This is the outline of my presentation. Uh, the concept of sustainability for and in space. I want to show you my um, uh, research overview of my group uh, with some experiment in space about shape memory polymer form and composite materials, in particular for the application for debricature that is very important for sustainability, and uh, then the challenging idea of the in space manufacturing, and at the end, the conclusions. Uh, I um, brought, uh, where is Nadia? There is Nadia in the, 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 the sentence of Nadia, of the um, Brazilian uh, agency. Uh, the capacity of building in space in the 21st century happens through connecting human needs to space solution in order to meet sustainability. But uh, what is sustainability in and for space? is uh, to make good ed educational courses in order to disseminate the concept of sustainable development in and for space, sure. Is uh, 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 to have the possibility to colonize Moon, Mars for far future scenarios, is to find solution for the survival of human in space, to make researches in space for better life on Earth, to enhance telecommunication for improving the life on Earth, to maintain the space clean and, and, and to save energy. Sustainability, therefore, can be examined by different point of view. So the space uh, um, is a, as an environment to ensure the future of humanity. This is a possibility. And uh, this is another question. The experimental activity on International Space Station and with the satellites and other uh, space vehicles is uh, sufficient for these purposes. My challenging proposal is a new small laboratory for e space manufacturing. How? Where? Why? I will give my answer at the end of the presentation. Before this, I want to show my activity. 
my research activity in space because in my university there is a lot of uh, uh, research in space but not a lot of courses, uh, educational courses uh, for space. I work in three main, uh, okay, in three main fields. Uh, shape memory materials, for in particular for uh, self-deployable structures, but also for grabbing and for space cleaning. In uh, uh, biomedical application, uh, we study hierarchical surfaces uh, for biomedical application and functional coatings. And uh, I define this the challenge, new materials and, and, and structure for comisk ray shielding. You can see the difficulties, uh, uh, the complexity in this uh, slide and the time necessary to reach uh, the results in this field. I have performed the two experiments in space, the first one in a NASA mission in 2011 about the, the uh, shape memory composite material that I will define in the next slide. And I'm very happy to show the second experiment on Beyond M1 Russian mission that I have performed in the 2013 uh, by means of an industry, Kaiser Italia. Hmm? And this I, I uh, had uh, good results. I have uh, two new experiments in the future, uh, one in, uh, with the in, in uh, two NASA missions. Uh, NASA MISE, uh, MISE is a faci external fati facility for exposure to space environment for one year. The first one in November of this year, and the second one in uh, May, in, in the next um, uh, year, on shape memory composite to evaluate the effect of space environment on this material to evaluate the um, uh, recovery of the material uh, by solar exposure and aging of the material. In the second, for the second, uh, same in the second sample, uh, we, we, are, um, we have a, a, a sample uh, for um, cosmic ray shielding materials in order to test also this. But what are uh, uh, forms and uh, shape memory polymer composite? Uh, probably uh, some of you know uh, um, this kind of material, but uh, these are new materials. And uh, these materials have shape memory uh, behavior. And you can obtain this by a thermomechanical cycle. If you have a block of this kind of material, this is in form of form, but it's possible uh, in, um, by means of a um, a shape memory composite material, and if you hit load, you can store this material in a very uh, small configuration, packet configuration. If you hit again, you can recover the initial geometry. This is very interesting for space. In this case, you can see the same for a cross. If you make the same thermomechanical cycles, you can deform the material. You can have a very uh, compact uh, structure, and then you uh, can recover the initial geometry. Uh, this is very interesting for self-deploying system, but it's also um, very interesting for space debris capturing. That is very interesting for sustainability in space. Uh, you know well uh, deploying the system. You can see some in this slide. Uh, we have performed an experiment in order to test our materials, uh, the opening of structures uh, and uh, for, uh, uh, for antennas, uh, for solar panels. Uh, and I, I will show you the behavior of this compact structure. Thank you. Mm? Oh. You can see in this video the behavior of this material. This is very compact. If you hit, the material can recover the initial geometry. In this case, uh, we use a not gun, but you can use uh, the eaters embedded in the materials. So, and you can give a, a hierarchy in the deployment. So you can have this. But you can use the same material to obtain uh, the opposite behavior, close and close, like in this video. You can, oh. you can close if you hit. 
you can close because you can give another geometry and then you record this is a one way hmm, uh, behavior so no problem you cannot obtain again the close the in this case the opening uh, eh? and the the um, uh, load exerted is not so high so you cannot break uh, for example the debris that you capture with this uh, system okay it's, i hope that is clear the behavior this is important as you know for space debris and uh, there are some uh, uh, example of uh, system that uh, nasa and other uh, um, um, institution want to use to clean space uh, this is an example in this in this uh, slide but uh, which is the new scenario my new scenario is possible to clean or make safe a single orbit it is it feasible launching rockets for grabbing for grabbing small debris for the manu uh, from the manufacturing point, uh, point of view is necessary to make an integration of processes by using raw materials but it's important to evaluate tolerances costs mm? so this is my scenario if you, i have a vehicle inside the system that make the, ma the manufacturing of the of the system and you can catch this uh, uh, in a single orbit uh, and you uh, and uh, you can uh, build in the in this laboratory the ex the mm, uh, mm, the right structure to capture the debris uh, we have some competencies to in order to make this we have the, s the material mm? we have a format uh, form of this material in has a platform we have uh, in the italian space agency a lab in which uh, we study this material and processes but also ad additive manufacturing that is necessary in order to make the system we have uh, uh, collaboration with other institutions for sensoring and uh, we are studying shielding material very important for this application and we have a collaboration with uh, uh, west virginia university about uh, printed electronics we need uh, a lot of things in order to make this but and your collaboration hmm, in order to make this this is an idea we have also a um, uh, roadmap a roadmap in order to make this it's very difficult uh, to evaluate the cost of this uh, initiative but uh, we have the base uh, pr uh, the base the base uh, basic principle uh, are observed we have the technology concept uh, we have formulated the, tec the technology concept we have uh, made uh, proof of concept experimental proof of concept we have made the uh, validation technology but we need other very very important step in order to make this um, necessary full sensor integration this is very important it could be useful to perform parabolic tests mm, uh, in order to uh, evaluate this or future space mission on ISS on on either vehicles uh, it's important the the help of industry uh, in order to build the um, systems and uh, this is a possible um, roadmap and in space my manufacturing is my dream only my dream in this moment my conclusion ha uh, sustainability seems a simple concept but the implementation strongly depends on the field and economical social industrial aspect should be examined i have proposed a challenging idea of the in space manufacturing interested for debris capture but also in the optic of a planet colonization mars and other for far and future uh, scenarios UN and the united nations and all the space agency together could promote and develop such a small but challenging laboratory as a first example of in space manufacturing laboratory this could be useful for all, for all the countries involved in space activity thank you grazie for your attention
Есть ли вопросы? Hello. Hi. Um, it's just a curiosity, Lord Dana. Do, do you have a lot of women working with you, or mostly men? I have a no. I have a boat. Yes. Yes. Have you have you studied the uh, repeatability of of uh, these um, um, uh, forms uh, yes. changing and, and the reliability uh, for space environment uh, application? Uh, you can uh, make a lot of time, but you need to hit the material. You apply the load, mm, you store, and you can rehit. No problem. Space environment, you have heating and cooling cycles. So what happens? No problem because because it's one way, and ah. one way. Once you heat it, and it stays like that. Yeah, and the ma and, and it's stored in this new configuration. In the first and second experiment in space, we have tested this. No problem in microgravity. You you op for example, you open and remain in open configuration because this is the first configuration of the material. So we have to design a process that is only made of, of one-way uh, sure. uh, grabbing one way. Uh, actions yes. in, in series to make uh, something yes. further. And stick, grab and stick probably to make things bigger it or, or different It shapes. depends on the object that you, you want to capture. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Please, how many uh, thermocycling you can use, for example, from bright and dark side of uh, spacecraft? Uh, I need only one cycle. Only one cycle. Only one okay. cycle, because uh, you uh, heat the material above the, tr the glass transition temperature. Mm. You, uh, the material changes properties, and you can deform. Hmm? Mm. You deform in a new configuration. If you cool, uh, you store in this new configuration. Okay. And no problem, you, it's stored in this configuration. If you eat again yes. mm, above this uh, characteristic temperature, the material recovers this initial geometry. Okay. Mm? You okay. can open or you, you can close. How many times? <laughs> Only okay, one time. this is a very good question. If you use a uh, uh, shape memory polymer form, you have this in a very long time. And you can use this, for example, for an actuator when you need a precise positioning of, of uh, a mirror of something like this. If you use uh, shape memory composite, it's fast, faster, but not faster like uh, shape memory alloy. Okay. It's another okay. behavior. I understand. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Спасибо. На этом наша основная часть девятой сексе закончена. И мы предлагаем в течение 10 минут провести дискуссию по этой сессии. Кто бы хотел высказаться, прошу к микрофону. Нет желающих? Тогда у нас есть следующее предложение. Коллеги из разных стран, кто приехал с постерной сессии, Если кто-то хочет выступить и показать свою презентацию, you're welcome. Тоже нет желающих? Удивительно. Ну тогда позвольте пару слов сказать. Очень интересная сессия. Для меня было Интересно посмотреть и поучаствовать в данном мероприятии. Я надеюсь, что и вам тоже. Есть презентации, которые имеют хороший практический выход. Надеюсь, они будут полезны для Организации Объединенных Наций, для включения те программы, которые вы планируете. И на форуме высокого уровня в Дубае вы представите те материалы, которые сформированы здесь. Очень хотелось бы, чтобы такое мероприятие было, может быть, на регулярной основе или периодически проходило не только в России, но и в других странах, чтобы можно было ознакомиться с теми проектами, которые реально существуют 
и вносят вклад в социально-экономическое развитие не только развивающих стран, но и стран, которые имеют доступ к космосу. Спасибо и до новых встреч. Thank you very much also for your kind words. And just one announcement before we break for lunch. For the moderators and the rapporteurs of the three working groups, I would like to have a short meeting in the meeting room uh, before we go to lunch so that we can put together our slides and be prepared for two o'clock. So just really 10 minutes uh, in the meeting room, please. And then uh, the rest of us enjoy your lunch and we meet here at two for the final session. And the most important one maybe, right? Thank you very much. <laughs>